Okay, let's discuss these questions. Number one, how do you understand the woman thing in that poem? One group took this question uh, and they said that the woman thing is kind of like feminine rage or like a feminine indignation, a kind of justified rage. Let's see if you agree. Page 31. The woman thing. The hunters are back from beating the winter's face in search of a challenge or task in search of food. So the hunters um, we will see later are men. It's the dead of winter. They're going out for food, but also for a challenge or task. It's like they're bored. They need to they need to have some kind of challenge. They need to have some kind of achievement. They need to like prove that they're strong men, successful men. But now they're back. Making fresh tracks for their children's hunger. Huh? So they're these men, their children are hungry, and I guess that's why they're going out to search for food. But they also think that a challenge is equally important, even though their children are hungry. They do not watch the sun. They cannot wear its heat for a sign of triumph or freedom. So they don't pay attention to the natural world. They don't keep track of time. They don't use. The sun. Uh, meaning like how much time it takes or how much effort it takes. They do not use that as a standard of judgment for whether they are successful or whether they are free. The hunters are treading heavily homeward. Heavily in this case probably means that they did not catch anything. Right? They have failed. Through snow that is marked with their own bloody footprints. So they have suffered. Empty handed. Aha, they didn't catch anything. The hunters return snow maddened, sustained by their rages. OK, so we kind of get this right. They want to. Kill something to eat. They want to have some kind of accomplishment, but they have failed. So they come back with heavy steps. Their feet are bloody, which means they have suffered and they are angry because they have failed. But what is this snow maddened? Do you guys know what this is? Um, have you ever heard that if you go somewhere that has a lot of snow and it's a great day outside, you have to wear sunglasses? Because otherwise the sun will reflect off of the snow into your eyes and people actually get sunburned from the snow. So snow madden is like being driven crazy by the reflection off of the snow. So this also tells us that. They suffer because they are not prepared. They aren't taking the risks seriously. So this stanza gives us a picture of like a group of rowdy uh, testosterone filled men who want a challenge and who use their hungry children as an excuse to go out and to hunt. And they fail. They suffer for nothing. They want triumph. They want freedom. Uh, and they use hunger as an excuse, but in the end they got nothing. And so they come back and they're angry. In the night after food, they may seek young girls for their amusement. So it's a very. How do I say this? It's a very predatory kind of attitude toward women, right? Not just women, but young girls. It's close to being. I don't want to say uncivilized. It's it's about pure appetite. Right for amusement, not for having children, not for marriage, but for amusement. But now the hunters are coming and the unbaked girls flee from their angers. So this, this is the same 
uh, situation, except we have one new word, unbaked. So bake can have two main meanings. One is, of course, making bread. So unbaked could be like not yet mature, not yet finished. Uh, so these girls are very young girls. Another possible meaning is um, like when they uh, they've been snow maddened by the sun off of the snow. When we suffer sunburn, we also say that we have been baked by the sun. So here unbaked girls can also mean that these girls stayed at home or in the village all day. They did not go out. They did not suffer under the sun. All this day I have craved food for my child's hunger. So now we have the I. I is a mother, right? And her child is hungry. Empty handed, the hunters come shouting, injustices drip from their mouths, like stale snow melted in sunlight. So you can imagine these hunters are coming back and they're complaining, like, why couldn't we catch any food? It's not fair. The world is against us. Everything is going wrong. Right, so they feel like it is an injustice. When of course we know it's just life. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. And it compares their attitude to stale snow melted in sunlight. This can be dangerous. Uh, when snow starts to melt, of course the the uh, environment becomes dangerous. It becomes slippery, it becomes wet, but also the snow is sometimes hiding things. So when the snow starts to melt, it can reveal things that were under the snow. So in this sense, this could also mean like something might start to happen and it might not be a good thing. It might be a terrible thing that is starting to happen. And you can imagine, right? When big tough bros start to get angry, it often leads to bad things. Meanwhile, so while all of this is going on, meanwhile, the woman thing my mother taught me bakes off its covering of snow like a rising blackening sun. Oh, that's so good. OK, so we have the woman thing. We'll come back to this. What does it do? It bakes off its covering of snow. So we have the use of the word bake, right? Uh, so we just said unbaked could be uh, immature or uh, not having worldly experience, right? Not going out into the world to take action. But here it's bakes. So it is actively um, becoming mature. It is actively going out to take action baking off its covering of snow. So we come back to snow melting, right? If snow melting here is revealing the terrible possible consequences of these angry men, then the snow melting here is revealing something else. It's revealing the woman thing. The woman thing is starting to appear like a rising blackening sun. So we've talked about the sun earlier. But here it's a blackening sun. Uh, traditionally, a black sun is uh, about revenge or like vengeful anger or like um, indignant anger. So this could be talking about revenge. It could be talking about some kind of violent justice. But of course, also this poem is by Audre Lorde. Audre Lorde is a black woman. So black here is also talking about her own culture as a black woman. So like this woman thing, it's a woman thing, but it's also a black woman thing. Uh, so yes, it could be feminine rage. It could be feminine uh, indignation, indignant uh, kind of revenge kind of thing violent justice is rising and is going to come and uh, fight against this situation. 
So the focus is on feminine anger and feminine rage. The idea of race is only very barely hinted at. Okay, do you have questions about this one? All right, next one, black mother woman. This question is, why is the speaker's mother so angry? This was today's most popular question. So let's look at this. Anger is here, your anger. I cannot recall you gentle. I can't remember a time when you were gentle. Yet through your heavy love, so the love is heavy, which is not a good thing. You don't want to describe somebody's love as heavy. It's like a burden. It weighs on you, which means it gives you trouble. Through your heavy love, I have become an image of your once delicate flesh split with deceitful longings. So uh, I have become an image of you means I now look like you, right? I am your, uh, in English we say, if I am your spitting image, that means that I look exactly like you. So I am now like you, now like your once delicate flesh. So like you were when you were younger, split with deceitful longings. Deceitful means like, uh, how do I say this? Dishonest or like uh, surreptitious, secret. So she's describing her mother when her mother was younger as having a secret desire. Uh, this is probably sexual desire, right? Flesh, Rosen. When strangers come and compliment me, your aged spirit takes a bow. Aged means old. So now her mother is old. Uh, takes a bow, so like thinking, right? Jingling with pride. But once you hid that secret in the center of furies, hanging me with deep breasts and wiry hair with your own split flesh and long suffering eyes buried in myths of little worth. OK, I think the key to understanding this poem is. What is the secret? What is that secret? I think that secret is talking about. Me. Now strangers come and compliment me and you are very proud of me. But before. You hid me. In the center of your anger. You hi you hung me. With. Uh, deep breasts and wiry hair, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So now you're proud of me, but in the past you wanted to keep me a secret. Uh, and so you kept me a secret along with these things. You wanted to keep all of these secrets. So what are these? Deep breasts. This is probably talking about when a, her mother's breasts. Uh, grew bigger and hung lower because they were full of milk for the new child. Wiry hair. This is talking about the traditional genetically determined hair of black people. If you've ever seen a black person's natural hair, it's usually not straight. It's usually it usually like uh, zigzags or has curls or it's not straight hair. It's wiry hair. Your own split flesh. This is talking about this line split with deceitful longings. So you also wanted to keep your own. Uh, secret desires secret. You wanted to keep it secret. And your long suffering eyes. So whatever is going on, her mother has suffered for a long time. Buried in myths of little worth. Uh, I think this line means that um, the mother thinks that if people knew about this, they would think that she, the mother, is of little value, but that this is a myth. It's wrong. 
the idea that everybody would think this kind of person is valueless, this idea is a is a myth. It's wrong. That's why all of these things are buried inside this myth. Because her mother believed that these are bad things, so she tried to keep all of them hidden, keep all of them secret. But I have peeled away your anger down to the core of love. So it's saying I have realized that under your anger is actually love for me. And look, mother, I am. So notice am is in capital letters, right? A, A, M. To be is to exist, right? Hamlet said to be or not to be, which means should I kill myself? Should I exist or should I not exist? So I, I am means I live, I exist, I'm here. So no, even though my mother, you have tried to keep me a secret, even though uh, you think that uh, having me would bring you trouble, yet here I am, I live still. A dark temple where your true spirit rises beautiful. So here she's saying that I, your daughter, am where your true spirit rises inside me. I think of you as beautiful. You are beautiful to me within me. And tough as chestnut. Chestnut is a kind of tree. Sorry, chestnut is a kind of nut. Uh, and it's very hard to break open. So you're tough. As, you are inside of me. You are beautiful. You are tough as chestnut. You are a stanchion. You can say a railing or like a guardrail or a barrier, a support, a stanchion against your nightmare of weakness. So you feared being weak, but inside me, my image of you, my memory of you fights against your fear of being weak. Inside of me, you are the opposite of weak. And if my eyes conceal a squadron of conflicting rebellions, so if I look at you with a daughter's love, but behind my eyes, inside of me, there are many different conflicting thoughts. Right, so above it says how much uh, you are beautiful, you're tough, you are strong, but I also have other thoughts, and they are like rebellions against these good thoughts. So if I have conflicting rebellions inside of me, I learned from you to define myself through your denials. So this is something that you did, and so I learned it from you. Denials is a very interesting word to use here. It has many meanings. It could mean, uh, in this context, right, I deny that I am feeling negative emotions toward you, that I have negative thoughts toward you. And through these denials, I define myself. By rejecting what people think are negative thoughts, I define myself as supporting you. Just like her mother uh, denying that she was weak because she's a single black mother, that denial itself turned her, defined her as not weak, as uh, not valueless. But denial also has another meaning here. It could, because throughout the poem, it looks like her mother maybe struggled to show her daughter how much she loved her, right? Peeled away your anger down to the core of love. Under your anger, there was love. Uh, so the love was not on the surface. So maybe these denials are a denial of love. Here, denial does not mean like saying you're wrong. De denial means I don't give you. So a denial of love could be like not easily giving love to her daughter. Uh, so I, I learned to define myself through your denials means by understanding why it was so hard for you to show your love to me, I understand you better, and through understanding you, I also better understand myself. And then denial could have uh, one more meaning. 
which is um, we said that she's denying how other people would say uh, an unmarried single black mother could be weak and valueless. But it could also be denying those very thoughts in her own mind, right? In these myths of little worth in her mother's mind, she was afraid that this would be true, and that's why she wanted to keep her daughter a secret. So these denials could be denying the myth to yourself. Things that you believe, but you know you shouldn't believe. Uh, today, I think something you, you guys might be more familiar with is uh, maybe some of you might believe that you're not skinny enough, you're not beautiful enough, you're not strong enough. These are beliefs that you know are unhealthy, but it's hard to stop believing. So here the mother maybe knows that she shouldn't believe that a single black woman, a single black mother is weak and is valueless, but it's hard to stop believing that. So she has to keep denying those beliefs to herself. And by fighting against those negative beliefs, she became the strong, beautiful woman that her daughter sees. And so her daughter is also, of course, a black woman. And it also has to face these similar beliefs about young black women. And so by denying those beliefs to herself, she's also defining herself as someone with value. So back to the original question, why is her mother so angry? Because most of society seems to think that young black mothers are well, let's see what we have here. Are of little worth, worthless. Are uh, sexually promiscuous. Like they like to have a lot of irresponsible sex. Um, are, you know, they face many different levels of discrimination. Um, discrimination against black people against women and against single mothers at the same time. So like fighting against the world's discrimination on these three levels probably made her mother very angry. Angry at the world, but the world is not something that you can express your anger to. So I guess a lot of the time that anger became expressed to her daughter. And maybe it took her daughter a long time to realize that her mother was not angry at her. Her mother was just angry and she was just right next by, uh, right nearby. And felt a lot of that anger. Um, and so that's why we also have the time contrast, right? Now you are proud, but you used to hide me. So it took time for her mother to acknowledge the joy and beauty of having a daughter. And it also took her daughter time to understand her mother's anger and to see that her mother still loves her anyway. OK, questions? All right, number three, is Wild Geese a religious poem? This was also quite a popular question, um, and most people ended up saying yes. Let's take a look. Wild Geese by Mary Oliver on page 33. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. So already line two and line three are very religious. Walk on your knees for a hundred miles is a very religious kind of suffering. You show you suffer in order to show that you are serious about repenting, about admitting your own error and your own faults. And then the mention of the desert is also very religious. Uh, famously in the Bible, Moses led the Jewish people through the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. That's not right. For 40, I think months, 40 months. Uh, and then in the New Testament, Jesus went into the desert to be tempted by the devil and he stayed there for 40 days and 40 nights. So the desert, a place of spiritual suffering, is a very religious location. 
But the poem is saying you don't have to do this. You don't have to be good. It's fine. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. So if you want to enjoy what you love, you don't have to suffer for it. You just have to let yourself love it. The problem is not with your suffering or your repentance. The problem is you're not letting yourself love. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Despair also has a religious meaning. Despair is when a religious person starts losing their faith. In terms of Catholicism, it's when some a, a Catholic person starts thinking, what if God isn't real? What if heaven isn't real? What if there is no afterlife? So tell me about despair yours and I will tell you mine. This is very um, radical. It's very extreme. The author is a Catholic poet. She's famously known as a Catholic poet. And here she's admitting, I too have moments of despair. I too have dark moments in the middle of the night when I start to doubt my religion. And so she's saying, if you have these feelings, you are not alone. Share them with me and I will share mine with you. Open yourself up, open up your heart. That's the only way you can go back to love. Meanwhile, the world goes on. <laughs> that's a beautiful, that's, that's a brilliant line. All of these like line one to line six, all of these are like personal spiritual suffering, right? Uh, thinking you have to suffer, thinking about repentance, thinking about despair. Meanwhile, the world goes on. It's your problem. It's not the world's problem. It's not religion's problem. It's your problem. Only you, or not only you, but like it's not. It's not a big world changing important problem like global warming. It's an internal spiritual problem. It's not as serious as you think. You don't have to be so afraid. Meanwhile, the sun and the deer pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. The world goes on. These things happen. And they continue happening no matter how much you are suffering inside. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Uh, so we have some symbolism, right? Going home. They know where they belong. They know where they're going. Now it's only waiting for you to rediscover where you belong waiting for you to rediscover how to get there. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting. So it's saying that the world is open to you, but it's not always a, a peaceful place, right? The world can be harsh, but the world can be exciting. The world is everything and it is all open to you. And just like these wild geese, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. So the world is always there waiting for you, waiting to welcome you back into the world. It's a family. And it's announcing your place. It's saying you will always have a place in this family. You will always belong here. Uh, now, the use of nature imagery, landscapes, mountains, rivers, geese, this is also religious. Because um, in the Bible, it says that God created the world, God created the plants, God created the animals, and finally, God created humans to name and take care of all of these animals and the natural world. So the natural world is a reflection of God's love and God's duty, uh, the duty that God gives 
to people. Um, according to religion, we should take care of the natural world, but also we can enjoy the natural world. If everything is created by God, then everything is a gift from God and everything is a reflection of God. So when it's saying that the world is always open to you, that there, you will always have a place in the world, it's saying, in fact, that God is always there for you. He is always waiting to welcome you back. Welcome you back into his family. Allowing you to come home to him again. Right, God the Father. It's a family image. The only thing stopping you is not that you are not good enough. It is not that you have not suffered enough. The only thing stopping you is that you have to let yourself love what you love. You have to let yourself. Uh, I don't know if this translates into Chinese, right? In Chinese, we have uh, we say that let is rang. But in fact, in English, there are three different words for this idea. Rang ren zhang zhang. In English, we have let, make, and have. Let you do something, make you do something, and have you do something. In Chinese, we all say rang ni chu zuo. But in English, these are three different ideas. To make you do something means that you don't want to do it. I'm forcing you. To let you do something means that you want to do it, but somebody or something is stopping you. And so I am removing that obstacle. I am allowing you to do what you want to do. And to have you do something is neutral. No idea of whether you want to or not. I don't care. I'm just telling you to do it. So here it says you have to let yourself love what you love. So you already know what love is. You already want to love, but something is stopping you. You yourself are stopping yourself from loving the world and from letting the world love you back. There is no barrier between you and God, you and religion. You yourself are the barrier. So. It feels like a big issue, a big problem, but it's very simple. You just have to find a way to uh, get out of your own way. And all of nature, all of religion, all of love will be open to you. So is this a religious poem? Fuck yes, it's a religious poem. It's a very Catholic poem. One group who took this question uh, gave an interpretation from a Protestant point of view. And it also made a lot of sense because right, the Protestant and Catholic religions are based on the same or similar uh, sources and materials. So there's very much similarity. But um, a Protestant reading can't make sense of nature as a reflection of God's love and creation. It can't really it, it. It's hard to use a Protestant understanding to make sense of walking on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. Because the Protestant, the basic Protestant belief is that as long as you believe in Jesus Christ uh, and as long as you believe in the Bible, you're good. You're going to get into heaven. There's none of all of this like suffering stuff. You don't have to work for it. You, there's no real issue about nature. It's between you and God alone. But this poem talks about all of these other things also. So it's not just a religious poem. It's a Catholic poem. Uh, some groups also mention the similarity between sharing your despair with the author and going to confession and telling your despair to the priest. Very similar, um, but here. The speaker shares their own despair with you in return. A priest usually would not tell you about their own despair. They would tell their own priest. Um, so here is not about between a member of the church and a priest, right? It's not about a religious person and the institution of the church. 
it is about a religious person and their own religious belief. The church itself is not part of this poem. It's only about the person's uh, personal, spiritual and religious belief, Catholic belief. Um, I know that it might be hard to. I'll talk about that later. Do you have questions about this poem? OK, next one, the return. Is this a love poem? A few groups also took this question. Let's look at this. So as I mentioned last week, this poem is based on the myth of the Minotaur in the middle of the maze, and then Theseus goes in to kill the Minotaur, and Ariadne gives him some thread so that he can find his way back out of the maze. The deed took all my heart. I did not think of you, not till the thing was done. So we have two people in this poem, I and you. And I, the person I is doing something. I put my sword away. OK, so I is probably Theseus. He's going to kill the Minotaur. Or he has already killed the Minotaur, right? Not until the thing was done. It is now done. I put my sword away and then no more the cold and perfect fury ran along my narrow bones. OK, so usually we say that fury runs in your blood, runs in your bones, means that you feel this fury deep inside yourself. Here it's not talking about anger. Anger is being angry at somebody. Fury is in Chinese we call this nu qi, right? It's something inside you. It's a kind of energy. He's talking about the kind of fury that you need in order to kill somebody. Soldiers, when they fight, they don't just stand up and kill the enemy. They have to work themselves into a furious state in order to overcome the psychological barrier of killing another person. They have to prepare themselves in order to fight battle. Same thing here. Theseus needed to have a cold and perfect fury in order to kill the Minotaur. It's cold, right? It's not hot. He's not angry. It's just a kind of energy. Uh, so no more. I've killed the guy. No more fury in my bones. And then no more the black and dripping corridors hold anywhere the shape that I had come to slay. So a corridor is a hallway. It's talking about the maze. So nowhere in this maze anymore is the shape of the person that I had come to kill. So I've killed him. Uh, but notice how it talks about it. It talks about the shape, right? It's in a maze, that Migong Mian, right? So you don't know, you can't prepare, you can't see around the corner. Any any time you turn the corner, your enemy right might be right there. So you're always paying attention to the light, the shadow, the sound of footsteps. It's a constant fear. Constant readiness for battle. But all of that is gone. No more because I have killed the Minotaur. All of this can stop. Then for the first time, I saw in the cave's belly the dark and clotted webs. So now that he's finished killing the Minotaur, he can start observing his environment and he notices that in this maze there are cobwebs, spider webs the green and sucking pools. There are pools of water, the rank and crumbling walls, the maze of passages. It's an old maze. Nobody is cleaning this place. So it looks old and dirty. It looks like it's falling apart. And I thought then of the far earth, of the spring sun and the slow wind. Right. When he's stuck in this terrible environment, he's thinking of a better place. And a young girl. And I looked then at the white thread. So here is when he remembers Ariadne. And so he looks down at his hands and he's still holding the white thread that leads outside of the maze. Like so far, this is a brilliant description of like focusing on doing something so hard, 
focusing so hard that you forget everything else. And after you finish doing it, you wake up, you look up, and the world is still there, and you are in this place, and you are holding something else. Hunting the Minotaur, I was no common man and had no need of love. Notice the past tense. While I was still killing him, I did not need love. But what about now? I trailed the shining thread behind me for a vow. The only reason I agreed to take your thread is because I made a vow. I vowed that I would return from this fight. I vowed that I would live and get out alive. I made a promise, so I took I agreed with your strategy. But I did not think of you. Ariadne. It lay there like a sign coiled on the bull's great hoof and back into the world half blind with weariness. I touched the thread and wept. Oh, it was frail as air, and I turned then with a white spool. A spool is the thing that gathers the thread. And I turned then with the white spool through the cold rocks. So now he's walking back out of the maze. Through the cold rocks, through the black rocks, through the long webs, and the mist fell, the fog came, and the webs clung, and the rocks tumbled, and the earth shook, and the thread held. So no matter what danger he passes through, no matter what terrible situation comes, always he can find he he has the way out in his own hand. So some one group thought this was not a love poem. It's about the myth. It's retelling the story. The psychology of Theseus going into the maze, killing the Minotaur, and then coming back out. But some other groups think that it is a love poem because it talks about not just the strategy of how to get back out, but the person who gave him the thread. Right? Uh, I thought of a young girl. In the past, I, where is it? I had no need of love in the past, but now maybe I do. Maybe I can finally see the love that's in front of me. And then, of course, no matter what happens, the thread that you gave me is still here. It's like uh, our commitment, your commitment to me is still here. Our bond is still there. Um, it's kind of like the marriage bond, right? When you get married, you have to say uh, through life and death, through sickness and health, through better or worse. All right, no matter what happens, we will always be married. That kind of idea. And so if you look at it this way, it is, it is a very romantic love poem. No matter what happens, even when I have forgotten you, even when I'm busy killing the monster and I don't think of you, you are still there for me. You are still waiting to lead me back out of the maze. So the poem is called The Return. Uh, and this could also be a metaphor for mental health. Right? If you're deep in depression or deep in your mental health issues and somebody is still there always waiting for you. Uh, I think Taylor Swift wrote a few songs about this idea. Like uh, Renegade. Or. Uh, Forever Winter. Are two songs about this idea. Very good songs. You can go take a listen. Okay, hey, question five. Are Oliver's poems feminist? Well, we have one poem left we have not talked about. Uh, poppies. The poppies in Su Hua send up their orange flares, the flowers, swaying in the wind. Their congregations are a levitation of bright dust of thin and lacy leaves. There isn't a place in this world that doesn't sooner or later drown in the indigos of darkness. But now for a while, the roughage shines like a miracle as it floats above everything with its yellow hair. Of course, nothing stops the cold black, 
curved blade from hooking forward. So this is talking about death. Nothing stops death. Of course, loss is the great lesson. But also I say this, that light is an invitation to happiness. And that happiness, when it's done right, is a kind of holiness, palpable, which means you can feel it, you can touch it, and redemptive, which means it will save you. Inside the bright fields, touched by their rough and spongy gold, I am washed and washed in the river of earthly delight. And what are you going to do? What can you do about it? Deep blue night. So this poem is saying life always ends in death. Life is full of loss and suffering, but it's not always about loss and suffering. In the moment, you can enjoy whatever happiness is nearby, even if it's just some flowers. Um, So like this light is an invitation to happiness. Life is full of suffering, but you don't have to suffer all the time. And happiness when it's done right is a kind of holiness. This is what God in his infinite love wants for us. He wants for us to be happy during our lifetime. Uh, and he, he shows us his love through earthly delight, the delight of nature and of flowers. So what can you do about it, Deep Blue Knight? You have no power. Death has no power over this joy. Uh, it doesn't seem too feminist, right? And then if you go back to uh, Wild Geese, also doesn't really talk about men and women, right? It talks about how, again, the love of God, nature, you don't have to suffer. Uh, the more feminist one seems to be the return because it's it's talking about a man who's so focused on his task that he forgets everything else. But once he has finished his task, it is a woman and a woman's love for him that brings him back into the world. So it's it's comparing the power of men and fighting with the power of women and healing or guiding. And it's actually saying that women's uh, this kind of power from women is even stronger than the martial prowess of men. But if we look at it from this perspective, then perhaps the previous two poems are also quite feminist. Who suffers for their religion? Who are usually considered the religious people? Men, right? Moses led the Jewish people. Jesus went into the desert. All of them are men, but here and the priest in Catholic religion, the priest has to be a man. Women are not allowed to be priests. But here it says, uh, I will share my despair with you. So I'm not a priest. I could be a woman. This could be not like a masculine institutional way of saving your soul. It could be a feminine, welcoming, caring, kindful way of saving your soul. And then the same thing in the poppies, right? Uh, the tri tri the uh, stereotype is that men are always focused on doing something great before they die, trying to conquer death, trying to leave their name in the history books. But here the idea is not to conquer death. The idea is to enjoy life before death. It admits that there isn't a place in this world that doesn't sooner or later drown in the indigos of darkness. Everything in the world will come to an end one day. Your life will end one day. The point isn't to try to fight against that. The point is try to enjoy your time on Earth while you have that time. So it could also be a very feminist way of thinking about life and happiness. Uh, and then question six, how can we tell these are from the late 20th century? Very quickly. Um, Postmodernism, using uh, fragments of traditional culture, playing with that. This is Mary Oliver's The Return, using Greek myth. Um, you have the poems by Audre Lorde about the black female experience. 
very similar to the novels written by Toni Morrison. Uh, we considered two different kinds of subcultures, uh, the culture of black womenhood and the culture of being Catholic. These are examples of multiculturalism. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Very quickly, I, I'd have to spend more time to think about it. Maybe uh, it's related to the counterculture, right? Social protests, these are all from different aspects of the culture, saying that the traditional way of thinking about it or doing it is incorrect. There are other ways to lead your life. OK, do you have questions about today's discussion? Next week, we're going to read the last thing in this handout, a short story called Cathedral by Raymond Carver. Raymond Carver is famous for writing deceptively simple stories. They look simple, but there's a lot going on. You may have to think about it. The story is about a man, his wife, and his wife's friend. His wife's friend is a blind man, and the blind man is coming to visit them. And the main character, the husband, feels very insecure about this visit. Uh, so next week, we're going to talk about this story, and then in the second period, I'm going to introduce the final exam. The final exam will begin next week. Okay, so have fun reading the story.